I'm so glad that you're all here. I hope you had a great week. Um, let's start off with Vader. Anything you'd like to share? You know, this is a safe place. Or maybe not so safe. Bump it. I'm sorry? Excuse me? What'd you say? Huh? I said I've had a pretty rough week. As a lot of you know, I've been going through some tough times at home. Excuse me, father? Yeah, about that. I'm not your father. All I care about at school lately is my status. How many friends I have or how many likes I can get on my Instagram, ladies. Everything is all about me. I've been using the force to bully kids just so I can feel better about myself. I've been looking at things on the computer that I shouldn't be looking at. I just want to fit in with the crowd. So I've been giving in to peer pressure just so people think I'm cool. I know I'm supposed to use the force for good, but it's so much easier to use it for evil. I'm always being called to the dark side. I find my lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> no! There are some things in life that you can't do alone, like play ping pong. Yeah, baby. Give yourself a root canal. Be stuck in a traffic jam. Are you serious? Come on! Perform a flash mob. Have a sack race. Go on a lunch date. Trust fall. Okay, here I go. Falling. Some things in life just don't work without the help of others. Your spiritual journey is one of them. When it comes to that, we're much better together.
Giving is easy and safe with our giving platform powered by SecureGive. Giving can be done from anywhere with your computer, tablet, or your mobile device. To give, simply go to the church's website, create a new account, or log in with your existing account. Simply select one time or recurring gift. Select your donation amount, enter your payment info, and then confirm your information. Visit our website and click on the giving button to learn more. Maybe you're an iOS or Android user. If so, you have an additional opportunity to streamline your giving with the free SecureGive app. Simply search SecureGive in the App Store or Google Play Market. Once downloaded, open the app and search our church name to save as your home organization. Just like with online giving, you can create a new account or use your existing SecureGive account to log in, give, and connect with us. But wait, did you also know there is now a way to participate in generosity in a way that's as easy as texting a friend? With text to give you can give using your mobile device by following these three easy steps. Number one, text the keyword and amount you'd like to give to our church's text to give number. Number two, follow the series of prompts and set up your secure give text to give account. Here, choose your desired payment method. And finally, number three, save the number as a contact in your phone for future use. Text to give only takes seconds to use and is the perfect way to connect with our ministry through giving. As you know, faith is not a destination. Faith is a journey. And some of you are pretty far along on that journey. But others of you may have a lot of questions. You may be at the very beginning of your faith journey. And the church, well, the church is the last place you think to speak up or ask your questions or voice your doubts. So let's change that. Starting point is where questions about God turn into conversations about faith, about your faith. It's a place where you can actually voice your doubts and explore some of the trickiest topics of faith, free from pressure and free from judgment. You see, we'd rather talk with you than at you. And starting point is where that happens. So if you're ready, let's talk.
Well, hey, welcome. We're so glad you're joining with us today. So I am standing outside our house. And if our house is anything like your house, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. Actually, the porch I'm standing on, we had to replace last year because it was all falling apart. How many of you have projects like that, that you need to fix up something around your house? Go ahead, share that in the chat. Also, how many of you would rather fix it yourself or just hire someone to do it? Or third option, you just let it go. Because I know a lot of us sometimes just let it go. But if you hire someone, that's more expensive, isn't it? You know, just like a house that costs money to run, so does ministry. So, hey, I just want to take a minute and thank you all for supporting the ministry of North Point Church. It's your gifts that really make it all happen. And maybe you just watch on YouTube, but we'd appreciate your gifts too. So thank you so much for supporting what we're doing here. We're really excited about the upcoming event we have called Community Connect with where we're going to support Mom's House. And so that's going to be really cool. But, you know, here I am standing outside our our house, but it's not a home. Because the home is the people. It's It's the place that your family gathers together. The house is just a place. Because sometimes, in an instant, life can change. And you focus on what is most important. Maybe you experience something like that. Today we're going to be talking about that, so don't go away. From beginning to the
unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me Love has called my name I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer
So have you ever had that moment that, you know, that moment where it changed everything? Like you were driving down, you were taking a trip and then all of a sudden the car breaks down and now you can't get to your destination or maybe an accident all of a sudden next thing you know you're in an emergency room and all that kind of stuff or or maybe you know you went to work and here they are and they come in to work or they call you into the office and say um by the way you're done and all of a sudden it's like whoa and life changed we actually happened had, this happened to one of our relatives um she's been working for a company for 25 years and got a on a zoom meeting for last friday and they said um yeah we're letting you all go boom 25 years you know boom and it's that moment where you get that it just changes everything life changed right maybe sometimes you get a call where someone's sick or, or literally someone's passed away and it's like and in that moment, in that moment, life is different. It's just different and it'll never go back. And in that moment, often there's a choice on how we respond. So welcome back to our series called Unbelievable Acts. And we've been looking at some really crazy things that have been happening with Peter and John and Stephen and Philip and, and all the big guys, you know, from, uh, you know, the, the 12 and then the plus the seven. And it's been really cool. And the word of God has been spreading and the Holy Spirit's been spreading in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and it just keeps going out. And if you remember, there's this guy, Saul, who's sort of chasing him down, and he's arresting Christians and, and throwing them in jail, and they're getting, you know, beaten or killed. And um, by the way, if you have not heard this, this is really cool. They're Angel Studios who produced The Chosen, the series. And if you haven't seen The Chosen, you got to see The Chosen. But they're coming out with a new series called Testament. And it is on the book of Acts. Only, this is the cool thing, it's in modern day times. And so the disciples are being chased, like, you know, by the guards and all that kind of stuff, but it's in modern day. So it'll feel really like, oh my goodness, probably sobering to, to know what it felt like in our day and time. But anyway, so look for that. I think that's got to come out in the spring or something like that. So, so Saul is out there, he's doing all this crazy thing. And then what happens is, um, God gets a hold of him, and many of you know the story, and he gets struck blind, and Jesus appears to him, and wow, it changes, and so he becomes a believer in Jesus, and that freaks out the apostles because they're like, oh my goodness, what do we do with this guy? He used to chase us down and try to hunt us down and kill us, and now he's one of us, and so what do we do with that? Paul, he, he just changes his name to Paul, that's how we know him in the New Testament, and he begins preaching Jesus. And he, so he's going into the synagogues and he's teaching Jesus. And this is where we're going to pick up in the book of Acts. So Paul came to Derby and to Lystra. And, and now Derby and Lystra are in the territory of Galatia. Now that may not mean a lot to you, but it's outside the area of Jerusalem. This is, this is further out. This is literally on the border of Asia. And why is this significant? Because Jesus left the apostles a charge. He said, listen, I, I've given you this thing. I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the way to the uttermost parts of the world, okay? To the remotest parts of the world, to the ends of the earth, however your translation reads it. And it was happening. And this is what is taking place in the book of Acts. So from chapter 13 all the way to the end of the book of acts which is chapter 28 we are now in the uttermost parts of the world okay the known world at that day and paul was out there planning churches and he's out there planning churches and he's out there raising up leaders and now he's going around to these churches and encouraging them and and here's what he's doing this is what was happening so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they grew daily in numbers so people are just coming to faith in Christ and they wanted to share that with their friends. And so they're sharing it with their friends and their friends are saying, yeah, I believe too. And, and just things are great things are happening. And Paul's preaching grace. And he's coming off this meeting that took place in Jerusalem when the apostles got together because there was an issue. And the issue was, you know, it was easy when they were all Jew Jewish and converting to Christianity because they were all Jewish. They all understood Judaism and the, and the laws and all that kind of stuff. And now they're just struggling through. Okay, now they were Christians. But now the Gentiles were becoming Christians. And it, and the question came up, well, do the Gentiles have to sort of become Jewish and, and, and then become Christian? It was like, well, no, that's silly because it's all by grace. And so the big issue came up was, do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? And... It was decided, so the, so the council comes together and says, well, we can't require them to obey the law that we're now leaving behind because Christ fulfilled the law. So no, we don't have to, they don't have to get circumcised. And all the guys shouted, hooray, that's awesome. And um, so this, this is a pivotal moment for the church and, and things are happening. So Paul and his companions, and they travel throughout the region of, of 
Phygeria or Phy Phygeia and Galatia. So again, this is the area of Galatia. And his companions that are with him are Silas. And, and that's big. You're going to hear a little bit more about Silas. And then Timothy. And we don't hear a little bit uh, that much about Timothy yet. But Timothy is, this is the, the Timothy that Paul writes letters to later in the New Testament. And Timothy just has this incredible faith. His mother was a strong believer. His grandmother's a strong believer in Jesus. And, and now Timothy, you know, is brought up in this family. And so Paul wants to, him to come along on this journey with him. So they, they go along. And again, if you recognize Galatia, that's, that's where Paul writes the letter to the church of, of Galatia and the Galatia, the letter to the Galatians. Um, why are they in this region? This is important because have the, the verse goes on and says, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And so it's like they get so far and then the Holy Spirit says, oh, no, you can't go any further. So I don't know if it's like an invisible barrier or what it was, but they just stopped. And, and I just think that's wild because the Holy Spirit is stopping them from going any further. And you're like, why? Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Well, there's all kinds of reasons. I, I, have no, I, I have no clue. I don't think they had any clue. They just knew the Holy Spirit said, nope, nope, you're done. Don't, don't go, stay here. And some of it could be a timing issue, you know, politically and all that kind of stuff. God's just working things out. It could be too much too soon. Because one of the things with, with ministry, and often, you know, we don't talk this, about this regularly, but in leadership, you always talk about this, is sustainability. Sustainability is huge in ministry. So when you want to start something, it's like, oh, let's start this thing. It's like, well, that's a great idea, but can we sustain it? Because not only you have to sustain it financially, you have to sustain it staff-wise. Because if it doesn't sustain, it's just going to be a big event and boom, push, puff, and it's done. So in leadership, you're always talking about sustainability. Can we sustain this? Is this possible? And so that's possible. What could have been happening is God is building his church. The Holy Spirit's going out. But there's a sustainability factor that leadership has to be built up in order for the church to grow the way it needs to. And uh, But it gets more interesting than this because then it says, when it came to the border of, of Mysia, um, they try they try to enter <laughs> Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And it's like, wait a second. So one answer is the, the Holy Spirit saying, no, you can't go. Now now it's like the spirit of Jesus is holding it back. And, and what I love about the not only the book of Acts, but is, you know, when, when you look at Paul's letters and you look at Peter's letters and, and John especially, like John is really big on this, they just saw God. And, and they write about it like that. It's like, well, Jesus was, well, God was, and the Holy Spirit was, and they just intermix them all. There's none of this, well, you got to do this, and that's the Holy Spirit, and this is Jesus, and this is God. It was just like, well, God, and all of them have different aspects, obviously, and different roles. But it was like, yep, that's that's them, right? And they just interchange them. And now, now here's what you got to know about the Holy Spirit, okay? Because this is important. The Holy Spirit works in the most unusual ways, through the most unusual circumstances and in the most unusual places. There's no boundaries for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just moves, okay? And so don't look for the ordinary because that's not really, like God works in the extraordinary, right? So don't think predictability. Think of things that are unpredictable, you know, and pray and expect the unexpected because that's what God does. And I know that's hard because when we think about the Holy Spirit, and I, I know we, we gravitate into our own mindsets like, oh, well, God will never lead that person to Christ. Or, well, you know, I've shared this and this is what usually happens. And, and we think in a predictability. The Holy Spirit's outside of that. So the Holy Spirit, like, you just got to expect God to do something un, unexpected. And so Paul is blocked by the Holy Spirit, is blocked by Jesus, okay? So now what? What, is, what does Paul do? So during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So guess what? He probably wakes up in the morning and says, okay, guys, we're, uh, we're going to Macedonia and God's telling us to preach there. So that's what he, they do. So there, when they get to Macedonia, they meet this woman named Lydia. And Lydia, they meet her on the way that they're going to this place of prayer. So here in Macedonia, there's a place of prayer. Now, whether it's, you know, all religions go there or whatever. But, you know, so Paul and, and Silas and Timothy, and they, they go to this place of prayer. And, and here they're meeting this woman. And they start sharing their faith with her. Now, she's described as a dealer in purple cloth. Now, if you know anything about, you know, cloths of ancient world, She's basically rich, okay, because purple cloth is a very wealthy color. It's a very wealthy fabric. So she's rich, and, and she received the Word of God. Like, she understood what they were talking about, Jesus. She receives the Holy Spirit. She, get, of course, gets baptized. She's, like, all excited. And then she invites them to stay with them. 
with her. And so, she, you know, they stay there, they hang out. So then here's what happened. So once when they were going out to, to the place of prayer, they were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. So if you didn't catch what's happening here is she's possessed. She's by, possessed by a demonic spirit. And this demonic spirit gives her the ability to see the future. Now, what does this tell you? Now, this is what's so great about Scripture. We learn so much about what goes on in the world, what goes on behind the scenes, just by reading Scripture, right? So what does this tell you? I, I mean, demons have the, the, the power to control outcomes. That's freaky. So they can't, as far as we know, they can't predict the future because only God is all-knowing, okay? But they have the ability to, to control things, uh, obviously under God's will, but they can maneuver and shape things. So here you have a fortune teller saying, this is going to happen to you, and then you have other demons working to make it happen so that somebody believes, oh my goodness, we got to listen to this fortune teller, right? So here's the thing, you know, people run into fortune tellers today, okay? They're still around, they have different names and titles. And, and some are like, oh, they're just all, you know, they got to screw loose. So they're just all, you know, fake and all that kind of stuff. And other people are like, oh, no, no, no. They told me the truth and this is what's going to happen. Here's the thing. I believe them. I just do. Now, I know somewhere out there, you know, they're shams. And, but I, I just, I, I believe it's real, okay? And, and a passage like this leads to that to say, well, yeah, it's probably real. The question is, what is the force behind it? What is the, the spirit that are behind that? Because God doesn't do that stuff. So if God doesn't do that stuff, because God has a special way he does that through prophets and all that kind of stuff, he doesn't do it this way. And, and it's just, so you got to ask those questions, you know? And so what's, what's really weird, the, that's scary stuff when you think about it. So this is what she does. And so she follows Paul and the rest of them, right? And she shouts out, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And you're like, why would she do that? She has like her own gig going. Why would she then hop on to Paul and Silas? Well, Paul and Silas are going around. They're healing people. So they got a greater power. She, doesn't, she obviously probably doesn't realize like where that power comes from or anything like that. But she's like, you know what? If I jump onto this gig, I could sort of get more you know, publicity and all that kind of stuff, right? And so she's just like going along with it. So she looks good. Now, this ticks off Paul, okay? Can you imagine? You know, like, he's over there, he holds somebody, oh, these people are from God, and they tell you how to get saved. And, you know, it's like, I don't know if you've been to one of those services where every time the preacher speaks, like, somebody interrupts and starts shouting. You know, it's that kind of thing where, you know, Paul's just like, okay, finally, he turns around to the Spirit and says this to the Spirit. Now, not to her. He says this to the Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit leaves her. Wild, right? Now, that's how you handle demonic spirits. It's that, it's that simple, but that difficult. Personally, I would hate to mess. I, I've never, I, I've been in some weird situations. I've encountered some weird things, but not like that, and I never want to. And, you know, and if you read the book of Acts, there's another instance in Acts that's really crazy, but when somebody doesn't have the right faith, the demonic spirit beats them up. And I, I won't want to witness that. I mean, it's just, it's like crazy, you know? And so hopefully... By God's will, none of us ever have to face it that on. But if you ever have to, you just got to call it out, you know. So here's what happens when our owners realize that their hope of making money was gone. They seize Paul and Silas and drag them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Isn't that crazy? They lost their ability to make money off of their slave who was demonically possessed, making them money. You know, it was James who wrote, this is the brother Jesus who wrote the, the letter we have in the New Testament. And he writes that the love of money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, not money, because money is, I mean, it's a great tool. And it's, I love when people are blessed with money. I mean, really, they, they could do so much with that. It's awesome. It's great. But the love of money will possess people. The love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. And, and here's the thing, you know, if something is questionable, if there's a hot topic out there, if there's an attitude, well, we don't talk about that. We're trying to just, you know, uh, follow the money. Just follow the money. You know, if you watch a good detective show, what do they do? You just got to follow the money because the money usually gives you the clue. Why? Because the money is the motivation behind it so many times. And that's what James was trying to share is like, look, when you see evil happening and evil things happening, 
there's probably money behind it. There's probably somebody making some money off of this. And the reason they're hiding it, the reason they're they're trying to bury it, the reason they're trying to get you to look over here is because there's money being made and they don't want you to see it. And if you dare to question, if you dare to ask, you know, here's the thing, exposing evil will get you in trouble. It will. And this is what they did. They exposed the evil spirit. They got rid of it. It came out of her. But behind the evils, this demonic influence and the spiritual forces that are at work, there's a dark side, right? And, and this is what happens, and this is what we got to realize that is going on behind evil. There, there's demonic forces that are at work. And, and you see this when you look at, I mean, right now in our country, right, we're seeing the crazy injustices. And I'm not talking about the big stuff. There's a lot of big stuff out there. But even just the little stuff, you know, you hear the story, you know, somebody's like, you know, they, they did something like, I don't know, they stole 100 bucks out of something and they're in jail for three years. And somebody over here murdered somebody and they walked the next day. And you're like, that doesn't even make sense. Why? Because we're, we're, there's evil spirits behind all this kinds of stuff, right? That's just the world we live in, right? There are things we can't talk about. Why? Because you're not supposed to because... You're not supposed to. That's what we're told, right? If you haven't seen The Sound of Freedom, I highly recommend it. Yeah, everybody has to see The Sound of Freedom. And it exposes the sex slave industry that is going on. I mean, there are more, actually, they, they put the quote on at the end of the movie that there are more slaves today than there ever been in any other time. And right here in America, the slave population is huge because of the sex slave industry. Um, Jim Caviezel, who stars in the movie, um, at the end of it, he comes out and he talks about how the movie was literally delayed for five years. Why? Because nobody wants to talk about it. Because this stuff is so prominent. There are so many things that are involved in all this stuff that we can't talk about it. We don't want to expose it because of what it may expose. Very similar to what's happening in Acts here. You know, because you, you look at stuff like, uh, most of you have probably heard of Epstein Island already, right? And, you know, it was basically, you know, an island where all those all kinds of sex, you know, underage people and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, when you watch the movie Sound of Freedom, you get the glimmer that, oh, my goodness, you know, Epstein Island is like a little, a little speck in the world of all that's going on here. But you take something like that and we know, you know, this guy went to jail and he died in a jail. But how come nobody else was convicted of anything? Did nobody visit the island? Did nobody? But we, get, we don't talk about it, right? Because it, it's buried. Why? Because follow the money, follow the money, right? Now watch how twisted <laughs> this turns around, okay? Because these men, they lost their money, lost their income. So they're, they're attacking Paul and Silas with this. And this is what they charge him at. It says, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept their practice. That's not the issue. They're twisting it. It's the smoke and mirrors thing. It's the money was lost. So let's hide what we were doing and let's blame others, right? And so, so Paul, now Paul and Silas get a turn in jail. I mean, Peter had his time. Now it's Paul and Silas's turn. And, and it wasn't good. I, I mean, they, they get beaten by rods. And then the scripture literally says they were severely flogged, not just flogged. They were severely flogged. So they're, so they're in bad shape. And then they're put in the inner cell of the whole jail thing and their feet are in the stocks. And, and this still boggles my mind that God sent them to Macedonia. God knew what was going to happen. And this is all part of God's plan. And, and we, we see all this you know, horrible stuff happening, but wait till you see what God does because this is amazing. So, so guess what happens? Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that uh, foundations of the prison were shaken. It's a sound familiar. I'm going back to Peter. Same kind of thing happened, right? And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Can you imagine? Like, all the prisoners are just like set free instantaneously. Unbelievable. But it gets better, okay? So the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors were open, get this, he, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Now, I, I just want to stop for a minute because I, I want you to, we could easily breeze past this, okay, and go on with the rest of the story. But I want you to think about this guy for a moment, okay? And we don't know much about him. He's a prison guard, okay? But if he lived a normal life like everybody else, like we, you and I do today, right? He probably got up in the morning. He probably gave his kids a hug goodbye. Maybe he wrestled on the floor with them or... I don't know if they played trucks on the floor back then. I don't know. But, you know, he's, he's played with his kids. He probably kissed his wife goodbye, and he probably went off to work, as he did so many days before. 
And then this thing happens where all the prisoners are set free and he's in this moment like, oh my goodness, what, what am I going to do? This is unbelievable. And the consequences for him are overwhelming. And what may happen to his family are overwhelming because he's responsible for that entire jail. And so what does he do? He acts in desperation. Not sure what to do. I don't know any other way out. I just want to end my life. That's desperation. You know, there's a Netflix series that came out in 2017 called 13 Reasons Why. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't have the guts to see it, honestly. Uh, maybe one day we'll watch it or something. But it's... It's, it's based around a girl, this is my understanding, it's based around a girl named Hannah who commits suicide. And she leaves behind 13 tapes. So that's each, each session of the first season. And the 13 tapes are specifically for individual people in her life that had an impact on her taking her own life. How sobering is that? Like you, if you had just done this or if you had not treated me like this. or And um, the whole, my understanding, the whole reason why it's produced was to get the conversation out there because suicide is rampant. Suicide is on the rise. It has been sharply on the rise since 1999. Now, I don't know what happened at the turn of the century, but it's been on the rise. Do you know the second highest group of those committing suicide are age 45 to 64? That's crazy, isn't it? But when you think about it, what's happening? Life is changing. Maybe you're not where you thought you were in, in your career. Maybe the kids are now gone and, and it just seems to be no hope. I don't know what it is, but that's a huge, huge age gap. You know, a huge age. The highest increase is 15 to 17 year old. And it greatly rose during the COVID. A 2021 CDC survey conducted on 17,000 high school teenagers found out that nearly a third of teenage girls said they had seriously considered suicide. A third, up nearly 60% from a decade ago. Talk about an epidemic in our world. Now, there's many reasons. I mean, there's depression, there's abuse, there's sexual abuse, there's um, pharmaceutical drugs that they're finding now have, have horrible side effects causing suicide thoughts. Um, illegal drugs cause it. And some of the main ones that hit people are a mistake that was made, either they made a mistake or they perceived that what they had or what was done to them was a mistake. They believe their, their problems are insurmountable, meaning there's no way out. Like this prisoner, this prison guard, right? There's no way out. I don't know any other way out. I just want to take my life, right? They feel that they don't have a support system around them to get through the difficult times or honestly, they don't have the support system. Now, here's a pivotal moment in this guy's life. Do I take my own life? with no regards to the implications of what that would do to his family, to those around him, to anything else. He just saw no other way out. What do you do? Do you know the best help that people find when they're struggling with, with suicide or even the thoughts of suicide? Maybe you have. You know, I mean, with those kind of stats, I, I'm sure each of us at sometimes maybe have gone through some depression with that. The best help is when people feel connected when people feel that there's some support around them, that there's somebody around them that just loves them. And sometimes it's only one person. And this is very interesting because this, this ties into Paul's response because this is what happened. So this guy's ready to take his life and Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. It's almost like he knew, and maybe he did know, but he stopped the jailer from taking his own life. The jailer then, then called for the lights and he rushed in, right? And he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Why? Because they're still there in the jail that they could have walked out of, okay? And I don't know about you, but if somebody beat me up so bad, I would want to just escape as soon as I could, right? And then he brings them, he bring, you know, this is just, he brings them out. And this is a crazy response, okay? Because it's a moment of desperation in his life, right? And, and he's like, I can't believe you guys are still here. And in that instant, in that moment, his life could have been so different, right? He would have been gone, but the impact that would have had on so many people around him, and all of a sudden, it's just put on hold. And so he asked them this question. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? From desperation, ready to take his own life, to I want to live, and I know you have an answer. What must I do, Right? And that question can't be much clearer, right? I, I, I want a life. I want to live. How do I, how do I have what you guys have? 
You know, he heard them singing in the jail. He heard what they were preaching, right? And so they reply this. They say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Now, you can't get much clearer than that either, can you? How do you get to heaven? How do you know? How can you be sure, right? What do I have to do? What's so important to do, right? Do I have to do this, 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 this? this? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's simple. Just believe. A belief so strong that what? It literally changes your life. It saves you. And then he adds this on. This is mind-boggling, but he says this. He says, you and your household. <laughs> and, and this is where you have to be careful when you read Scripture, okay? Because you, you see this little thing and you're like, wait a second. If he decides to be saved, does that mean his whole household gets saved? It's like, he can't choose for his family. They have to choose for himself, don't they? Right? You know, when it comes to the book of Acts, and this is very important to remember the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a history book. Okay? So it's not an epistle. This is not instructions from Paul or Peter or James or any of those. This is a history book. Now, it's not that there's not huge verses in there like this, like believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. But because it's a history book and it's written in history, it's not a how-to book. And so we have to be careful. We have to watch what it says and we have to watch for specific promises that may have been made only to this guy, okay? Or may be a future prophecy, not even a promise. I remember my brother and I, we had, we had just came to Christ probably within a year, maybe not even a year, and we went away to a Christian festival. And it was like, we were so excited because it's like, there are thousands of people here that are all Christians, right? And Christians from all kinds of backgrounds, okay? You know, we didn't know the whole, there's all kinds of spectrums of Christians, okay? And because we were just, we believed in Jesus. We just like wanted to be around people who love Jesus, right? And I remember sharing our story, and this just came to me as I was reading this passage. And so we're sharing stories of people we're getting to meet and all that kind of stuff. And and I remember somebody, I, I can't even remember her name, can't picture her face. I just remember somebody shared, it's like, you guys, we just got to claim the promise of Acts 16. I'm like, well, what's that? You know, like, well, he said, you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household will be saved. So you just got to claim that. You got you to gotta go to Jesus and say, Jesus, we believe in, in you, and, and we just claim our whole household to, to, to believe in you too. And I was like, that just sounds a little weird, but we'll, we'll, okay, whatever, you know, and they prayed for us, and, you know, and, you know, I, I'm so grateful because we had some really good teachers in, in our lives that God God put into our lives, and, and you know, they cleared that up a little, and it was like, okay, wait, wait a second, you know, they have to make a choice for themselves, and, and what he's saying here is, 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 this may not be a promise at all. It might just be what's going to happen, and you just have to wait to see. But you have to be careful of claiming false promises. Because sometimes as Christians, we can do that. And the book of Acts, there's a lot of things in there that people claim. And it's like, well, it's just the history. It's what happened. Be careful, right? So listen to the rest of the story. So the jailer brought them into his house. And he set a meal before them. So he's, you know, he's making up for some damage, right? And he was filled with joys because he had come to believe in God. So he's a new believer here, right? And then he and his whole household. Now, what do you think took place at dinner? He told his family about what had happened. He told his family about these guys who believe in Jesus, and they told him the whole story of Jesus. I mean, we could just assume, but why? Because they have to hear. I mean, Paul tells us that later. How do we come to faith in Christ? We hear the message. We hear the gospel. And then we make a decision to believe. And so here is family. They come. They make a choice, and they believe. And and, and the father's faith changed their lives. His life changed. And, and it could have been a tragedy. Instead of coming home with these prisoners and, and bringing them a meal and sharing his faith with his family, they could have been getting word that their, their dad, their husband, had just taken his life. But his life changed, and, and maybe his occupation would too, because I don't know how, how easy it's got to go back to the jail after all this, right? And, and maybe even the place he lived, you know, his house, maybe it would change. And, you know, the place he bought them to, brought them to was his, his house. It wasn't his home. His home was his family. His house is just a place. His home is the people in it. And that is what could have been lost. What he had experienced was an aha moment. It was a moment that changes you. It, it, was, it was that moment where, oh my goodness, everything has changed only now for the better. Have you ever had one of those? Have you had one recently? 
Kyle Eidelman, I don't know if you've ever, ever read any of his books, but he came out with a newer book. And, and in there, he gives this great definition of an aha moment. I thought it was great. And I want to share it to you as we wrap up. And the first thing he says is, it's a sudden awakening. It's that moment that, that gets you. And it may be a choice, but it, it is probably by surprise. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, life's different. Something hits you, right? And now you have a choice to respond to. And the second is this brutal honesty. That you have to be honest with yourself, you have to be honest with God, maybe even being honest with people around you. And that's what changes you. All of a sudden, your eyes are opened up. That's what the, that's what the gospel does, continually in our spiritual life. The, the, the gospel just opens up our eyes and we see something different. And, and when we see it differently, like, you can't go back. There's no way you see it that way anymore. It, it's, you're now here. Wherever here is, you just, yeah, I just can't see it that way. I now see it this way. And, it, and you can't, it's, you no longer see it the way you used to, right? And what this causes is immediate action. That's the aha, a sudden awakening, a brutal honesty, and immediate action. It changes you. That moment, God changed your life and you will never be the same. That's what happened to the jailer. And I bet that's what happened to Paul and Silas too. Their lives are changed because of what God did through them to impact this family who now believes in Jesus Christ. You know Moses from the Old Testament. Well, you probably didn't know him. I didn't know him either. But, you know, Moses from the Old Testament, okay, God charged him with bringing the people out of Israel, out of Egypt, right? And so he brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt, and he brings them to the Promised Land. Now, they didn't believe him that they could go into the Promised Land. They were too afraid. And so they were punished. For 40 years, they wandered the desert. And Moses leads them the whole time. And that was not a fun leadership. Believe me, if, if you read the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and all those, you'd be like, wow, I would not want that job. When he finally gets to the promised land at the end of his 40 years, Moses is now 120 years old. 120. He started that job at 80. Can you imagine starting your job at 80? Could you imagine putting that on a resume? I'm just looking for a job to lead people for the next 40 years. They'd be like, uh, yeah, I don't think so. You know, um, so he is 20, 120 years old. I mean, he's like ancient, okay? And because that is definitely ancient, okay? You know, the older you get to figure, oh, yeah, 60, that's nothing. 80, that's nothing. 120, that's pretty old, okay? So he's up there and he gets to, to this, this point and he's looking out at the, his people. And he goes to them, he goes, um, I can no longer lead you. I can no longer go with you. And Joshua's taking the helm. And so he gives words to the people and he says this, he says, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. I love that. Don't be afraid of them. Whoever them is, okay? For them, the Israelites, it was all the people in the, in the land that they're about to go take, right? For Paul and Silas, it was these leaders who they took away their money and for that girl who got sick, I mean, her the evil spirit came out of her. Oh my goodness, they would have been the evil spirits, right? Don't be afraid of them, whoever them are. For the Lord your God goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. The writer of Hebrews reiterates that same exact verse. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you. You know, it's unbelievable, the book of Acts. Acts 16, the chapter we've been looking at, is only one chapter, and so many lives were touched. Now, here's the challenge I want you to walk away with, is to pray for that aha moment. To pray that God would bring you an aha moment in your life, that you would be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to His leading, that that moment will change you. And it will change you for the better, and it will allow you to impact others like you never have before. You know, Paul was open to what God was doing. And look what it did. It changed his life, and it changed the life of so many other people. May God do the same through you and me. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I I'm praying on behalf of myself and everybody who's listening, watching, everybody who's here, just being a part of this. Would you bring us that aha moment? Would the Holy Spirit speak to us in such a way that, Lord, we would see something, maybe hear something, but that would change us 
so that we can never look we can never look back we can't look back that way any longer because we see it in a new light lord help it to cause um cause us to change so give us that courage to make that decision that lord will just change our lives but most of all impact other people Thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation that is there just by believing in your son. Thank you so much for sending him to die for us. And so, Lord, we pray for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
of me.